Welcome to the YFP Real Estate Investing Podcast. I'm Nate Hedrick. And I'm David Bright. We're both pharmacists and real estate investors that believe that real estate investing does not have to distract from a meaningful career in pharmacy. Each episode, we share stories that educate and inspire pharmacists to leverage real estate investing as a part of your financial plan. Hey, David, how's it going? Hey, good, thanks. How you doing, man? Good. We've got uh, Thanksgiving approaching, which is just absolutely wild. We're this far into the year, but it's uh, it's a good time. Yeah, yeah. It's it's kind of that season of coming into reflection and thankfulness and even some planning for the year ahead if you're kind of ahead of the game there as, we're, as we approach the end of the year. So there's this temptation at this time of year to come in with this thankfulness vibe and say real estate investing or even investing in general. It's unicorns and rainbows. There's never a bad day. You should never <laughs> for next year, right? And and while goals aren't a bad thing, smart goals can be a really valuable thing. Uh, it's also important to acknowledge that real risk exists in investing, in real estate investing for sure as well. And mitigating against those risks as much as possible can be a good fit, particularly for the pharmacist personality type. Yeah. And, and we felt like today's guest was kind of the perfect fit for finding that balance. Uh, we brought back Stephen Nguyen from episode 86. If you remember Stephen at all, he is a hospital pharmacy director who has amassed over 100 units of long-term real estate. I mean, just absolutely killing it. And he kept things rolling, right? Even after we talked to him way back when, he kept going, kept buying more assets. Um, and and if if you've caught the spoiler, right, of, of the balance here, it's that some of that, some of those investments didn't quite work out, right? Some of those things started to sour, and it, uh, you know, I, I don't want to catch anybody off guard with with that, but there's there's a downside to real estate sometimes, and and living through that and can be very difficult. And so we wanted to bring Stephen to talk about that. He really talks about his, some of his financial problems, some of the the mental health problems that he that came about as a as a result of these financial woes. And I feel like that's a really powerful message and something that. Again, we're not trying to hide anything. We want to be as transparent as possible with real estate investing. And Stephen does that just to a T. Yeah, we talked with Stephen before the recording about some of these details and and some of the things that he that he shared and wanted to share about the ugly side of real estate investing that just doesn't get discussed. Um, at the same time, he wanted to jump quickly into how others can avoid those same mistakes. So mm -hmm. I don't want to minimize or be insensitive to the pain. I know that that pain can be very real. For a lot of real estate investors, mental health is a real thing. Uh, at the same time, I want to honor Stephen's desire to you know, allow him that transparency and then move past that and also talk about how others can avoid that same pain. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think if, if you talk to anybody about real estate, one of the things you're bound to hear from someone is how they swear real estate is terrible and how, uh, you know, all the extra costs that you're going to incur and the evictions you're going to deal with. And it's going to, you know, real estate is all bad, right? And so we don't want to just dive into that. Like, that's not the goal here either. There are financial risks and financial woes. And, and that's, that's, you know, a bummer, quite frankly, but there also are positives to it. And you can learn from those mistakes. And so Stephen really does a great job of focusing on when stuff goes bad, how do I take that, learn from it, and then spin it positively? And so I just, I really appreciate him taking the time and the 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 transparency to share this story because it's 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 a tough one and, it, and he does a really great job with it. Yeah, I think it's inspiring too that towards the end, he, he doesn't describe how he just sells everything and gets out of real estate, right? He, <laughs> right? he describes how he redirects, how he mitigates risk, and how he continues to move forward and to do more real estate investing. So circling back to some of those end of year goal setting thoughts, I hope that investors that are particularly weary of risk in, in this market uh, can see some of these downsides, can heed Stephen's warnings, can learn from his story, and can prevent similar issues in your own investing journey. Yeah. Well, with that, I hope you guys enjoy the episode and uh, we'll take you right to it. Hey, Stephen, welcome back to the show. Hey, very excited to be back on. You know, as I mentioned, a year definitely flew by for me. <laughs> I can't believe it's been a year since we had you on. Uh, you last joined us on episode 86. You, uh, again, on that episode, shared some truly inspirational stuff about growth. Uh, it's just been awesome to hear your story and, and kind of follow your journey. And you reached out recently and said, you know, Nate, I've got some updates. Like, let's let's talk about that. So that's exactly why we wanted to have you back on. For those that may have missed episode 86, uh, first of all, go back, rewind, check it out. Fantastic. Uh, but those that might have missed it, uh, give us a little background on, on who you are, and uh, uh, we'll start there. Yeah, so my name is Stephen Nguyen, uh, pharmacy director at a hospital. So I graduated pharmacy school back in you know 2013, 
been a pharmacist for about 10 years now. Uh, first four years I spent as an inpatient pharmacist and the most recent six years I spent in kind of the hospital administration, you know, pharmacy director, pharmacy manager positions. And, you know, throughout that whole time, uh, kind of fast forwarding it, I paid off $250,000 student debt in four years. And around 2017 is when I started investing in real estate. You know, in the last episode, as I mentioned, I started house hacking in California and then, you know, I house hacked one property, two property, three properties. And after that, I jumped into apartment complexes and mobile home parks and <laughs> scaled up to 90 units while working full time uh, without any partners. So that's kind that's of awesome. a, a quick and dirty <laughs> of, yeah. uh, episode, yeah. the last episode. You, you gave the two minute version of the whole episode. Like now, if now if you heard that and you aren't re- rewinding the 86 and you haven't listened to it yet, like I don't know what you're doing, right? Because that's there's a lot yeah. in there. So check it out. Yeah, so I want to I want to hit a few terms before we get into the next steps. House hacking. Can you can you walk us through house hacking and how that applied in, in your situation? What house hacking meant in your world? Yeah, so for me, you know, after paying off my student debt, I just want a place for me to live, and you know, I'm single, so you know, I'm buying a four bedroom house. I don't need a four bedroom, twenty three hundred square foot house uh, that I bought for hundred thousand dollars in the Bay Area. <laughs> So what I wanted to do was I was just used to having roommates. It's the college mentality. So I lived in the master bedroom and I'd rent out the other three bedrooms for about $1,000 each, uh, including all utilities. So they actually covered my mortgage payment. So all I had to do was pay the property tax, insurance, the utilities, the HOA, which came out to be around 1500. So that's really cheap for the Bay Area. I know it might sound expensive in other markets, but it helped me um, get into real estate, uh, reducing my costs and you know, just basically only an asset that you can do 10% down with because it's a primary residence. So that's basically how I got started and how I built my foundation. Yeah. And then from there, you mentioned scaling really quickly to 90 units. So I know that there's a lot of folks listening that are like, you know, I'd love to have one house or maybe two houses that would be investment properties. Maybe they're vacation rentals, maybe they're long-term rentals, something like that. So that when I wake up at retirement, I have a paid off house and use that as a way to augment their, their retirement plan, their financial situation. 90 units is a big jump from the person that wants one or two. What made you decide 90 units? And in this case, even more, you grew beyond that, right? So what what made you decide that you wanted a triple digit number of units and, and why that was such a crucial part of your financial plan? Yeah. So for me, you know, California, it's an all appreciation market. You're not going to really cash flow. Like for context, my first single family home in the Bay Area, you know, it rents for about $4,000 and I bought for 800,000 and it kind of breaks even a little bit negative if I have some repairs here and there. Um, but the appreciation was massive, like hmm. from 2017 all the way up to 2023, it's now worth around 1.3 million and I bought for wow. 800,000. So I made half a million dollars of equity on that property Jeez. and I was cash flow negative, right? You know, <laughs> when interest rates lowered, I, I refinanced it, lowered my interest rate organically the rents raised because you know california you do get good renters um especially in the bay area there's a lot of high income w2 workers there and you know i just house hacked a couple properties right so every time i got a new job i got a new house that was a primary residence house hacked it and as you can imagine you know my first house hack i made about half a million dollars of equity but all my prop- properties i house hacked made half a million dollars of equity mm-hmm. so i just said all right i'm gonna take all this equity do a cash out refinance pull out the money, lower my interest rate, and then I dump that into apartment complexes. And I chose Oklahoma to invest in because it's more of a cash flow market and less of an appreciation market. So for me, what made me scale was when I kind of looked on LoopNet. Um, so LoopNet is kind of like uh, Zillow, but for apartment complexes. Mm-hmm. And I was looking in Oklahoma and I was like, wait a second, a 30 unit apartment complex costs a million dollars. But in California, that gets me a single family home that I'm currently <laughs> living in. And that sing- one single family home in California gets $4,000 in rent versus a 30 unit apartment complex. Let's say it's 500 bucks a unit. That's $15,000 in rent. Mm. So I just said, for the same amount of money, I can significantly increase my cash flow. So that's when I just said, you know what? I want to buy more units and I want to buy in a cash flow market. So while price didn't really vary, um, the, the cash flow did. So that's what I kind of made my pivot into, you know, apartment complexes and mobile home parks, which is where I'm, I'm currently at. So I leveraged the homes I house hacked, took that equity to buy the apartment complex 
is with more units. So that's how I was able to scale significantly was just taking that equity and then reusing it, reinvesting it and getting more units, which gets more cash flow. I love that. And I think something that gets overlooked is, you know, we have the luxury right now of looking back over the last five years, right, of your investing. And it sounds like in this, you know, couple of minutes of conversation, it just sounds like all these things have been done. But this is stuff that you're doing day in and day out to make it happen, right? This isn't like magic, right? And I think people listening to this immediately assume, oh, this guy got lucky. This guy, like, no, you've been grinding this out for five straight years. This isn't just, it just happened overnight, right? So, I think people get intimidated when they hear 90 units or, or, or 100 units or 500 units, but it's not like these fell into your lap, right? This is all stuff that you've been doing along the way and, and, and you know, taking some lumps here and there. So just putting that in perspective for everybody that's listening, that this is not something that just happened overnight. So I think that's important. And I want to I wanna jump to some of those updates. I think that's, that's where we kind of left off the last time was that that 20 unit apartment, you had talked about getting ready to refinance that. I know that we ran into some issues here uh, in the last couple of months, if you've not been paying attention, with interest rates. So tell us a little bit more about that that 20-unit apartment complex um, and just give us some updates on that. Yeah, so basically my 20-unit apartment complex, I bought it in May of 2022 using a hard money lender. So mm -hmm. basically at the time I did 25% down, it was 9% interest only, which at that time I thought it was high, right? And as you kind of alluded to, um, you know, today it's, it's normal, right? 9% is right. normal. Back then, 9% was high. So basically what I did was I down 25% down. Uh, they actually baked in um, some renovation costs. So I got $100,000 from the lender that I could leverage as well to renovate these 20 units. So in those 20 units, I renovated about 15 out of 20 of them over the past year. And one unit was completely burned out. Like Oof. the prior owner they had a little grease fire in the kitchen and it burned down the entire unit. And wow. his insurance was so bad. He probably bought really cheap insurance that he didn't repair it. It was just a burned down unit. So I knew coming in, I got quotes. It was going to cost me $40,000 to renovate that burned down unit from complete nothing into a brand new unit. So mm -hmm. I had a $100,000 budget, $40,000 went into the burned down unit. And the other $60,000 was kind of sprinkled out through the other 14 units. Um, you know, it varied per unit, like some needed about, you know, 10,000, some needed about 2000 and the average was around 5,000. So, you know, as you start renovating it, um, you start to get a flow of things, right? Like for me, when I renovate, it's very simple. I have LVP flooring, luxury vinyl plank flooring. Um, all 20 units have the same design. So mm -hmm. it's economies of scale. I use a neutral color paint on the walls, uh, kitchen cabinets. Um, I typically repaint them if they're still good. If it's actual wood, you can actually repair those easily and cost effectively. If they were burned down, then I bought in some, you know, new kitchen cabinets, typically shaker, and mm -hmm. I would renovate the bathroom. Um, you know, you just LVP flooring throughout the whole unit. So it doesn't vary between kitchen, living room, bathroom. Mm -hmm. um, you can get some vanities from Home Depot and the bathtub kits from Home Depot as well. So I, I try to keep it very cost effective, tenant proof, and also very clean modern. Um, because for me, I didn't want to over renovate these units because my market rent was around 500 bucks. So, um, when I realized that this brand new unit that was, that I spent $40,000 on got me 500 bucks in rent versus a unit where I just put $2,000, make it rent ready. I got 490. I was like, okay, well, there's not much of a margin there. So you don't really need to overkill it. So, you know, over that time I basically renovated, churned all my tenants. I have all new tenants now and, you know, did that at rapid speed um just to get ready because hard money loans have a 12 month term so mm -hmm. you're under the gun right you have to go fast and as we all know delays always happen right mm -hmm. <laughs> renovation delays getting supplies or delays and doing the cash out refinance actually took me a lot longer than expected so a, a lot of great stuff to unpack there. The, the, I think the hard money is where I want to start and then we can kind of progress from there. So I think people get scared off by that idea of hard money, right? But but hard money is just basically borrowing from not a bank, essentially, right? Like to break it down, right? You're getting it from not a, a bank. It's, it's from a source that is basically an investor, right? They're investing in your deal and saying, look, I think you're going to be successful with this. At the end of 12 months, I want you to cash out refinance or sell the property or whatever you want to do. And I'm just going to make 9% on my money, right? That's that's generally how that works. Yeah, yeah, you hit the nail on the head. So basically, you're skin the game is I put 25% down um, and I'm paying 9% interest only. And I have to pay about 1% to 2% uh, origination fee. 
And yep. uh, from there, uh, every time I, um, I have to upfront the renovation costs. So what happens is if I put $40,000, I would fix up the burn down unit and then they would send an inspector um, to inspect it. If everything checks okay. off, then they'll give me my draw and I cool. pay a fee for all that. So that's at a high level what a hard money lender is, but you're right. It's not a traditional bank. It's not like Wells Fargo, Chase. It's an investor usually who has money and they want to you know, make money via 9% interest, which is great, right? But also yeah. have your asset secured in case I fail. They can take over my asset. Right, right. So when you get to the end of that 12 months, essentially your options are either come up with the cash from another property, sell the property that you're invested in, or do the cash out refinance. Which, which did you choose? Yeah, so for me, I'm a buy and hold investor ideally. So I want to do the cash out refinance. Mm -hmm. So I actually started the process, you know, in May of 2023. So about a year later, uh, because I had a good relationship with the hard money lender, you know, they're pretty flexible. They extended my term a bit and, and they knew what happened, right? So from okay. May of 2022 to May of 2023, interest rates soared like crazy, <laughs> right? Like I was getting 9% was a hard money loan rate, right? But mm -hmm. in May of 2023, 9% was a normal rate, right? Hard money loan rates were like 12 to 14%. So, you know, when I underwrote this deal, I'll be honest, I did not anticipate interest rates to be that high, right? Uh, kind of taking a step back in May yeah. of 2022, I thought I bought this for 350. I put $100,000 into the deal. I'm all in for 450. I thought I was gonna be worth $100,000, mm. right? Fast forward to my cash out refinance, interest rates went up. If interest rates go up, what happens? My cap rate goes up. If my cap rate goes up, my value goes down. Mm. So what, what did my ARV end up being? My ARV was around 560. Mm. So that was, that was 240K less than I thought, right? So when I did my cash out refinance, I didn't pull all my money. I was in this deal for about $200,000. I only pulled out 80,000 out of 200,000. So I left $120,000 into the deal. Right. And most people would say, oh, that's not that great. But to me, I'm like the fact that I was able to able to even execute my cash out refinance, the fact yeah. that I even got a loan, my interest rate was 7%. And the fact that I was able to, you know, pull out some money on the deal at least and still own this asset, I still think of it as a win. I went from a home run to a base hit. But yeah. that cash out refinance took me 90 days. It took me 90 days to do a cash out refinance. And for context, usually when you buy a property fresh without owning it, it takes you about 90 days. Mm -hmm. But it took me 90 days to do a cash out refinance with a lender that I had an existing relationship with because the market was so crazy, right? Lending wow. terms got so much stricter. It was crazy. And I mean, you're, you're totally right about, you know, like, again, that going to, for, to be a base hit, right? Like, I think people will look at that and go, oh my gosh, it was nowhere near what you thought it was going to be. It's, it's a, you know... It's a disaster, but it's really not. There are people sitting out there right now coming up to the term of their hard money loans and the property is worth less than they're going to be able to get, like the less than they owe, I mean, at this point. Um, so you could have been in a much worse spot. You're, you're totally right. You could have sunk $300,000 into construction costs and now all of a sudden you're losing money on that cash out. Not only do you have to get the new loan because the hard money is executed, but now you have to come up with more capital to basically keep that deal afloat. So you're, again... I, I, I commend you. I think that, that could have gone a lot worse, I guess is what I'll say. Yeah. And what was kind of nice too, because I, I bought this property with instant equity, right? Mm. I got it off market using my direct mailing campaign. So I got it for three fifty. dollars it appraised at $400,000 day one. And, you know, the upside, you know, was probably around eight, $800,000. And I think it would have been that had interest rates stayed what it was. Mm -hmm. But the fact that interest rates went up, despite it doubling what I underwrote, I still was able to pull out some money. So like I said, when interest rates drop down and whatever, how long it takes, um, believe me, I'm gonna do another cash out refinance, lower my rate, pull out some more money and probably get all my money out that I initially put in. So mm -hmm. it's gonna be a burr just over a longer time period. But if you have that protection of buying up instant equity, being able to force appreciation and still getting that cash flow, because I'm grossing about $10,000 a month on this unit now, mm -hmm. you know, 500 bucks per unit on average, that's how you, you win the game, right? Like yeah. this is my first recession that I've gone through. I, I invested in 2017. It's always been up, right? And this is the first time where I got punched in the, in the gut a little bit, but I was able to mitigate that punch um, strategically by buying right and having a value at strategy. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's really important to unpack there. You, you mentioned a few things as well about uh, how interest rates changed, that changed the cap rate, which changed the value. And I think for a lot of folks that have 
only worked in the single family space or the small multifamily space, or they own their own home. Um, I don't know that as many people are familiar with how interest rates can not just drive, you know, like your monthly payment and things like that, but interest rates also can be a big factor in driving the value of the property. Um, so if I'm understanding correctly from what you're saying, when interest rates for mortgage rates went up, uh, that takes the cap rate up, knowing that an apartment complex is not valued based on comparable sales like a lot of, of residential homes are, but an apartment unit is based on the amount of cash flow it produces for the owner because an apartment unit is valued essentially as a business. And so no one really wants to borrow at 7% interest on a, on a building that produces 5% returns. You want the returns to generally be at or above the market interest rate. Is that about right? Yeah, you hit the nail on the head. So, you know, typically Oklahoma is an eight cap market, but if your interest rates at 8%, no way is a bank going to lend on that, right? So that's why they right. in increased it, expanded the cap rate to 10 cap. Mm -hmm. So I was underwriting at an eight cap. Reality was during the appraisal, it was a 10 cap, but it made sense, right? Because my interest rate was about seven to 8%. You know, I was able to get a lot of connections. I used Bank of the West, which financed my 26 unit, so they knew me. Um, so they gave me a lot of discounts, like at least if I didn't have the prior relationship, my interest rate would have been probably eight and a half, to be honest. Um, so like I said, you can, they're going to increase the cap rate accordingly. So if interest rates go up, cap rates will go up, which will decrease your value, right? Because if your net operating income, that's the income minus the expense, your gross rent minus your expense on an annual basis, that's your net operating income. And you divide that by the cap rate. If you divide it by 8% cap rate, it, the value is going to be higher. But if you divide it by a 10% cap rate, the value is going to be lower. Mm -hmm. So that's how, you know, I know they say apartments are recession resistant, but, you know, everything is going to take a hit when interest rates go up, right? And the lender, they, they want to see something called a debt service coverage ratio of 1.25. So if your interest rate goes up, your monthly mortgage payment is going to go up. So you need more cash flow in order to satisfy their 1.25 uh, debt service coverage ratio. So it's all connected, right? It's all just numbers at the end of the day um, with, with apartments, which is why I love it, right? Like, I mean, I never expected <laughs> to be this bad, but I can explain it to myself easily after reading the appraisal report. It's just very numbers oriented. I know eventually when just rates drop, like the cap rate's going to drop, my value's going to go up, I can cash out refinance, and it may hit that 800000 uh, initial ARV that I anticipated. And at that point, you know, it would be a home run, but it just took me, um, you know, maybe a couple more years longer to run those bases than I would like, but <laughs> eventually it gets there and, and time's flying as, as I mentioned earlier. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, I think that's a really important perspective to understand that the, the interest rate shapes the value. And so part of what made this successful is you went and you found a property that needed a ton of work. You got it at a huge discount. You did that work. You did the heavy lifting and that, that helped create some value. It's really cushioned against kind of the market forces pushing your value down. Those interest rates, though, that it's kind of hard to tell right now how long it's going to be before that comes back down, if it's going to go up further. So, you know, I'm curious your perspective and your projections here with interest rates. Is this something that you think is going to come down early in 2024? Are you expecting things may get worse before they get better? Are you going to have to hold this property for several years before things come down? What's your What's your gut tell you about the market right now? Yeah, that's a great question. But kind of taking a step back, um, you know, for me, my strategy when I get loans is I want seven to ten years fixed. So mm -hmm. with commercial loans, you have a it's usually thirty year amortized loan, just like single family residential real estate. But with commercial, you have an option of one year fixed, three year fixed, five year, seven year, ten year fixed. So typically how it works is if you have a ten year fixed, your interest rate's gonna be higher. Versus if you have a one year fixed, your interest rate's gonna be lower. So it, it, they're correlated, right? For me, I always teach get at least seven to ten years. So you at least know what your interest rate is and it's predictable. And if, if the interest rate's lower, Great. Just refinance it. You might have a prepayment penalty of one to two percent that you might hit. But as you mentioned, I don't have a crystal ball. But my prediction would be, you know, given it's election year, typically interest rates do drop down a little bit during the election year, um, just to stimulate the economy. You want more optimism as we go into the election. So I imagine that interest rates will probably pause or drop down a bit in quarter four of twenty twenty three. But I think in um, twenty twenty four. I think it's going to kind of level out and, and maybe start a downtrend. But like I said, the moment that interest rates drop down again, all the real estate I currently own, the value is going to skyrocket again. 
Like I know the moment interest rates are around 5%, when it starts trading down to 5%, it's going to trigger the next bull market. So for me, I'm just trying to um, position myself in a powerful position with cash reserves to be able to strike when that opportunity comes. Because like you said, the moment interest rates drop, I'm going to be doing a lot of cash out refinances, pull out a lot of money, and I'm going to have a lot of liquid nitrogen where I can just strike on good deals, right? And make yep. aggressive offers and, and invest in a power position because I already own cash flowing apartments that are cash flowing now before I didn't. So I want to definitely take advantage when interest rates drop. So for me, the way I view it is, hey, everyone has the same conditions. We're all playing the same game right now. But because of my current portfolio, I do have a slight advantage, unfair advantage, um, where I can strike. And like I said, whether or not interest rates go up or down, I think I can survive. My strategy is, is pretty recession proof. I couldn't say that last time because I've never been through a recession. But now that I'm going through it, I can confidently say I I've, yeah. uh, am a little bit bulletproof. I, I can't say until I'm tested, right? Like, I don't know if I can take a bullet until I'm shot. <laughs> so, so I took a couple bullets and, and I'm still standing here uh, today. So... Um, can definitely say that the strategy that I, I use to buy real estate has been tested now. So if I'm sitting here and I'm listening to this and I've yet to buy my first property, right? I'm listening in what you sound, what you're saying sounds awesome, but I'm thinking about buying. What's some advice you might have for someone sitting in, in that person's shoes, right? Like, should I be just setting aside cash and waiting? Should I try to find a deal within the, the crazy market? Like where, where's your, where's your gut tell you to kind of go with the experience that you have? Yeah, to, to be honest, like throughout my whole investing career, you know, as I mentioned, I started in 2017. Like when I bought my first house, I didn't think it was that great of a deal. Like mm. I, it was average deal. Like it was just an on-market deal. You know, I paid asking price and every piece of real estate that I bought, I just thought it was okay, right? I didn't anticipate mm -hmm. real estate to skyrocket this much, right? And I've always just kind of had that approach where like, okay, is a deal I'm buying, does it make sense right now? And it may not be a home run deal. Um, right now, but like, does it work for me? And does it work for my strategy? Right? Like with single family homes, I just want to live in the house, right? <laughs> and and rent out some rooms that I need a place to live. And then with apartments, it was just like, oh, well, you know, I'm finding these off market apartment complexes, I'm be able to buy up instant equity, and have the ability to increase the rents, which will increase the value. So, you know, for me, for those getting started, I just would recommend the key just to get started, like pick your yeah. unfair advantage. Right. Like mm -hmm. my unfair advantage was just house hacking initially because, you know, I'm based in California. Mm -hmm. I know what cities are good in the Bay Area. I know what cities are good in Los Angeles now, now that I'm here. So I just bought that. You know, you can leverage it significantly, you know, five, 10 percent down if you have a good W-2. You know, most pharmacists, we have good W-2s, right? Banks like us for the most part. Um, and then from there, um, you just like you said, you'll build equity over time. You know, it's, it's, I know it's hard to say, wait for like five years to build up equity, but I'm living proof, right? I just waited for five years. I didn't do anything special. I was right. just working my W-2 job. I was just renting out the unit, you know, taking care of any, you know, tenant complaints. If they left, I had to rent it out. I didn't do anything special, right? So the key is just to get started. And from there, that's when I started to exponentially grow, right? Because I started to build equity in my real estate and I leveraged out to buy apartments. So for me, what I kind of preach is, if you want to get started in apartments, you need at least three hundred thousand dollars to get started. I know it's a huge number; it's very intimidating, right? And why I say three hundred thousand is because twenty five percent down on a million dollar apartment complex—that's two hundred fifty k right there. And you're yeah. probably going to need fifty k for in case things break. So I know it sounds super discouraging to most people, but um, there's nothing wrong with starting off with house hacking. You know, one house a year for like five years, and then eventually, if you build up three hundred thousand dollars of equity, you can sell all those and trade up to an apartment complex. So the key is just to figure out a way where you can make a move to buy real estate and just make sure you buy it right, right? Like mm -hmm. I get it, interest rates are high, but with interest rates high, a strategy that people should be doing, which I'm considering right now is buying new builds. With mm -hmm. new builds, you can negotiate with these builders because they want to get these properties off their books, mm -hmm. right? They're building 200 units and they would love to offload some before the end of the year. Right. So you can negotiate discounts where, hey, can you give me thirty thousand dollars in uh, repair credit so that I can buy down my interest rate? So I'm buying down from eight percent to five percent interest rate and five percent is normal. Right. So I think at this moment, it's just key to get creative hmm. and find ways to make moves that don't completely bankrupt you and just be in the game. The, the key of real estate is staying in the game as long as possible and surviving. If you can do that, you'll be successful. Right. When you get wiped out, the ones who got wiped out in 08, those are the ones who had to rebuild from scratch. 
So the key yeah. is just to not get wiped out. Make a move that makes sense for you and slowly give that time because time compounds everything, right? Like I know it's easy to see like, oh, one year I bought like a, a, a thousand units. Um, but I know for me now as an operator, like that's probably not as sustainable as, as it sounds. Yeah. So, you know, the key is just to get started and make a move that makes sense for you and leverage your unfair advantage. Great, great advice to no matter where you're at in your investing right now. Um, you know, Stephen, one of the other things I wanted to talk about, because we mentioned it last time on the show, um, the, the last time you were on the episode was this mobile home park that you were under contract on. Um, and I know that you, you sold that this year. So I want to talk a little bit about that quickly, because I think uh, that's another space that we haven't covered a lot on the show in the past. Um, and again, I just think uh, you, you left the teaser hanging on, on episode 86. Yeah. And so we want to make sure we, we finish up on that. Yeah, I left the cliffhanger about a year ago. So, right. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, about my mobile home park. So basically, I, I bought a 200-lot a mobile home park in uh, Selma, Alabama. So what mobile home parks, it, you define it based on lots. So just because mm-hmm. it's 200 lots doesn't mean there's 200 units, right? When I bought it, it had about 30 units occupied. So with mobile home parks, there's two models. So model number one is park-owned homes. So that means that me as a landlord, I own the home and I rent it out to a tenant, just like an apartment complex. Mm-hmm. Another model, which is more popular on the podcast, if you listen to the mobile home park, uh, mobile home podcast, is the tenants own the home. Um, they own the home and they just pay something called lot rent, right? So, for example, my park had a combination of both, right? And it depends mm-hmm. on your market. Uh, in the southeast, like Alabama, Georgia, the park owned home model is more common. Uh, because these people, you know, they don't have enough money to own the homes themselves, right? Mm. So it's very common where me, the landlord, I own the home and they just pay me rent, which includes a lot rent and the rent to live there. But I'm responsible for all the maintenance, right? In Alabama, your rents is roughly around 500 to 700 bucks, depending on if it's an older one or a newer one. Mm -hmm. In terms of lot rent, that's when they own the home, right? So you can buy a mobile home for $5,000, spend $2,000 to fix it up, plop your home on a piece of land and you're basically paying uh, me, the person who owns the land, about $150 to $200 in lot rent. So supposedly it's more passive, right? As me, the landlord, I don't have to deal with any maintenance issues. Uh, I don't have to deal with renovating the units or the toilet breaks. They're responsible. The wire here breaks. They're responsible. So that's the one that most apartment syndicators and operators talk about is that tenant-owned home model. And it's less maintenance, less headache, um, less expenses and it's more scalable, right? Mm-hmm. So I had experience on both ends. So for me, um, I've seen both. And like I said, it depends on your market in California. It's mostly, they owned, they own the home. They pay a lot rent in the Southeast. I own the home as a landlord and I pay, and they just pay me rent. So there's pros and cons to each, right? <laughs> so let me kind of dive into that. So with the park owned home model, um, you have a little bit more control, right? You could, if the tenant's not good, you can evict them. Um, they pay you rent. You can make sure that they play by the rules. Like, are they mowing the lawn? All that stuff, right? With the tenant owner model, you don't control anything, right? They just pay the lot rent. You know, hopefully they, they mow their lawn, upkeep, you know, the landscaping. Um, but they can do whatever they want, right? They can paint the house green, blue, pink, whatever color, right? <laughs> it's their home. You can't really enforce anything. They can have a trampoline in their backyard and jump on it. Can't really do much about that, right? In terms of eviction, if I own the home as a landlord, it's easy for me to evict somebody, just like a normal apartment complex, single family home. Once a tenant owned home, the eviction process is a lot more complicated because they own the home. They didn't pay you the lot rent. Mm. So basically when you evict them, you just put a lien on their home. And then when they sell it, then you get your money. But if they don't sell it, it may take you a while to get their money. Mm. So what I was experiencing was it was a lot harder to evict the people who own their home versus when I owned a home. So another thing to consider too is for the park on homes, mobile homes are not as durable. When you renovate a mobile home, it's not like an apartment complex where it's durable, it lasts a long time. Mobile homes, they deteriorate over time. The value goes down over time. Versus apartments, the value goes up over time despite it depreciating and getting having that normal wear and tear. Hmm. So that's just something to consider. So that's just kind of a high level of what mobile home parks is. I just touched the tip of the iceberg on it, but that's just great. kind of want to, to leave it at that. For mobile homes and so the, the place that you purchased it was 30 unit or 30 uh 30 homes uh to begin with on, on 200 plots um what what was the you know like the kind of the process of that and what did that look like for you 
Yeah, so for my mobile home park, I, I bought it for $1.1 million. And, you know, once again, it, it kind of blew my mind because I thought this is the same price as my single family home I bought in San Francisco. <laughs> and it's a 200 lot mobile home park. So there's ability to bring in homes. We call it infilling in the mobile home park lingo is you're able to infill homes that you can either rent out and you own it, or you can try to sell it and try to sell it at a profit. So you make money, but also now you get a tenant that's paying you lot rent. Mm -hmm. It was a multi-pronged approach, right? I had about 30 homes there when I bought the park. So I have 170 homes that I need to infill. It's called infilling. So initially I had about 20 homes that were already there, need some renovation. My goal was to basically renovate those, put about maybe $5,000 to $10,000 each to renovate it. And at that point I could rent it out for about 500 bucks each, or I could actually sell those homes too, to tenants who want to own the homes and they just pay me lot rent and they can work with lenders like 21st mortgage or 21st cash or triad. There's you know a lot of only handful of mobile home park lenders and they can actually qualify for the lending, buy my home off of me. And now they're paying me a lot rent. So I took that asset off myself. They own it and they pay me a lot rent. So given that I have 170 homes to infill, I took whatever I can get to fill up these homes, right? If you want to rent the home, great. I'll rent you the home. If you want to bring your home, Great, you can bring your home. If you want to uh, move your home from another park to my park, great. Like whatever it was, when you have 170 lots to fill, I'm not picky, right? And so for me, my goal was, you know, if I can bring in, if I bought this for 1.1 million with 30 homes infilled, if I fill it up to 200, you know, the value is going to increase significantly, right? It might be like close to $10 million. And I just thought this is my golden goose. This is my retirement. I can say bye bye to pharmacy. Right. <laughs> and then uh, right off on the sunset. Right. Um, so that was kind of my plan. I, I want to renovate about three homes per month. So that's about 36 homes a year. So about roughly 40 homes a year. And I want to continue that. And what was nice about mobile homes is I can bring in a brand new mobile home for about forty five thousand dollars, 100 percent financed through lenders, plop it down there. At that point, I can rent it out or I just can sell it. So you get a lot of leverage with mobile home parks, especially when you're infilling. So it's great for somebody if you don't have much capital, right? So imagine I brought in five homes, 100% financed, and I'm able to rent these out and able to cash flow maybe like 200 bucks each after all my expenses and after my loan payment. Or I can also sell some of those homes too or do a rent to own model, which is actually very popular in the mobile home park space as well, where basically, um, let's say your rent's 500 bucks. If you want to do rent to own, I might charge you 100 bucks extra a month. So you're paying 600 bucks. That's a hundred dollar margin. And you do that agreement for five years. And after that five year agreement's up, I transfer the title into your name. And then now you basically just pay me a lot of rent. So that's kind of another strategy that, that people use uh, when infilling mobile home parts. Because as I mentioned earlier, over time, the value of these homes go down um, because they're not as durable, not as sturdy. So organically over time, mm -hmm. the value goes down and it becomes more affordable for them. And they've been paying you extra every month. So that's what's really nice about mobile home parks, um, at least to say. But, you know, we can kind of go in a bit later, but I, I can kind of share about the reality of what it was really like uh, to own a mobile home park. Yeah. So, and I know you sold this property, right? So it, it didn't, uh, it wasn't the, maybe exactly the golden goose that you were expecting. What, what was the end result? Yeah. So to, to kind of um, summarize, I basically sold this at a loss. So okay. I actually put in around, uh, I was probably all in for about $1.6 million. So I put in about half a million dollars to renovate the park. And what people wow. don't realize is when you own 55 acres of land, your landscaping bill is very high, right? You have okay. a lot of hundred foot trees. There's hurricanes there. So every year around this time of year, I need to start trimming down these trees. And believe it or not, it costs about 700 bucks to trim a hundred foot tree. And that's more than the rent that I was collecting per unit. And when you have 55 acres of land, when you mow one from one end to the other, by the time you're done, you have to start over again because the grass just grew, right? You know, <laughs> Alabama, it's the Southeast, it's high humidity. There's a lot of crab weed that grows fast. So these are all the expenses that you don't realize, right? That it's fixed regardless of how much rent you get. So yes, if I'm at 30 out of 200, I'm losing money every month. But if I'm at like yeah. 150 out of 200, my fixed expense is still the same. I'm probably cash flowing. So that's the piece that I didn't really realize when I got into the deal 
you know, I had consultants and property managers who were highly experienced with mobile home parks. But of course, at the end of the day, they're trying to sell you the deal, right? So they kind of upsell the deal to you a little bit. They kind of sell you this rosy value at a plan. But in reality, I was like punched left and right. Like I bought this park during COVID. So what happened during COVID? Supply chain issues. It took me a long time to get my supplies. And with mobile homes mm. renovations, you can't just go to Home Depot and buy a door for a mobile home. It's a different size door. You can't just go to Home Depot and buy a window. It's a different size window. If you need to buy appliances, they're typically smaller in mobile homes. You can't go to Home Depot. So you have to buy these things, you know, <clears throat> from different sources and then they get shipped over to you. But, you know, during COVID, supply chain issues, things took a long time. Dealing with renovations was way more challenging with mobile homes. You can't just take a person who renovates apartments to renovate a mobile home. Yeah, so it sounds like the expenses end up being way more than you were expecting, which is super unfortunate because when we just like we talked about earlier, a larger property like this is valued as if it's a business, right? So if your revenue is lower and your expenses are higher, that business is not going to be valued anywhere near as high. So it sounds like you mentioned selling this for a loss, which I'm sure scares a lot of people that are driving in a car listening to this podcast right now that no one wants to be in a real estate investment that loses money at the end of the day. So having been through that, one thing that I'm taking from this is you're certainly not scared off from other real estate investing. You're continuing to just plow through this and make it happen. So what advice would you give someone that's now, particularly in this market, a little bit fearful of like, it's possible to lose money in real estate investing, despite what all the TV shows and everything say, what, what would you advise someone to protect themselves in this market? Yeah. You know, for context, like when I was, I bought 80 units at eight months, right. And all my two apartment complexes, a 26 unit, 20 unit in my mobile home park were all value add. So I was doing juggling multiple balls at the same time. I had all the capital allocated towards that. But as I alluded to, everything took longer than expected. Everything mm -hmm. costed more money than expected. So what made me decide to actually sell was to actually protect my apartment complexes. So I knew that I had about maybe $100,000 left for allocated towards my mobile home park. So that's what pull, got me to pull the trigger to actually sell it. Because I'd rather own 50 good units versus 90 unstable units right? Where I'm mm. very stressed. So let me kind of share about the sales process because it was not fun, right? <laughs> so <laughs> so as you kind of alluded to, my expenses are very high. I was cash flow negative on the property almost every single month because I'm putting money to renovate it. And even when I stop renovations, I'm cash flow negative because it's just a lot of fixed expenses that comes with 55 acres of land, right? Um, so for me, what I did was, okay, in November of 2022, I said, you know what? I want to sell this mobile home park. And I asked my property manager, who was also my consultant, said, well, what do you think this is worth? And he just said, well, I think I can probably sell it for around $2 million. I just said, oh, that's amazing. I, I That's going to be a win, right? Because I'm all in for 1.6 million. But, um, you know, kind of fast forward uh, to January of 2023, I got an offer for $1.9 million. And I was mm -hmm. just like, oh, wow. So he was actually right. Right. But it turns out that the buyer that I was working with um, wasn't very serious. Right. So he, we got under contract, got me an offer. Um, he would take over my seller finance note. I would carry money in second lien position a little bit as well um, to make it less of a down payment. And then he would give me a down payment and then I'm free of the deal. Right. So this guy was a syndicator. Um, and what happened was we had a 60 day contract. And every time I hit the deadline, he wanted a 30-day extension, 30-day extension, 30-day extension. And that happened from January all the way up to June of 2023. And every time he just said, I need money. To, I need to raise the money. I need to, more time to raise the money. And I just said, well, I don't mind you raising the money, but every time I'm extending this contract, I want more earnest money deposit, right? Because the earnest money deposit is what protects me, right? In case you flake out, I get this money. This is my protection and it's guaranteed and non-refundable. Right. So we kept on going back and forth, back and forth. And, you know, throughout the process, I ended up didn't increasing the earnest money deposit because my consultant was just saying, well, Stephen, this is the best price you're going to get. Like, so just tough it out. Um, you know, at that point, it was a $300,000 profit, which, which was amazing. I thought I was going to lose money in the deal. And I just said, OK, mm -hmm. you know, I, I'll work with this guy. Um, but he was such a bad uh, seller, non-communicative not transparent, like the complete opposite of me, right? So I learned what a shitty 
seller and buyer is like, right? <laughs> I was always, I've always been a good buyer and seller, right? But I thought what I was doing was normal. But after trying to sell this park, I realized, wow, most people are terrible, right? They don't communicate. <laughs> they're slow. Uh, they don't communicate timely. It's just like, uh, whatever is terrible, just do the complete opposite of what I am, right? And then well, what happened was on the day of closing, I remember this vividly. It was June 15th, 2023. We're going to close. I signed all the documents, sent it over to escrow, and the buyer ghosted me on the day of closing. What? Uh, I was going to close for $1.9 million. Instead, I'm now left wondering, okay, I've been bleeding $10,000 a month for the past six months, and it's not fun to bleed $10,000 a month, right? Even yeah. though I have to be allocated... I felt so terrible, right? I was at the lowest point in, at myself at that point, right? In Man. June of 15th. And I just said, oh my God, like, how am I going to survive? Right? Like I've blown through my reserves. I have a line of credit that I have against my stock portfolio, which I'm using, but you know, stocks are volatile right now too, right? So if you dip below a certain amount, so I'm, I'm in like fight or flight mode at this point, right? Like what's going to go on? Am I going to have to sell something? Am I going to have to sell an apartment complex? Am I going to have to sell a single family home? I didn't even know what move to make, right? At this point. So I just said, okay, well, this guy backed out. You know, I took his $30,000 earnest money deposit. That only covered three months of my expenses. I, I've, mm -hmm. I've been doing this deal for about six months. So I talked to my, um, you know, consultant and he just said that, you know what? That's like the best offer you can get. Your realistic offer is going to be 1.6. And I just said, okay, well, that, that's break even, right? I'm like, okay, I'll, I'll take a break even, right? To me, the key is I want to just break even, be free of the stress. Uh, I had shiny object syndrome, which is why I bought my bone park. Like I, I fully admit it, right? I'm recovering shiny object syndrome addict, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just went all in on apartments in Oklahoma, right? I was literally deciding between a 50 unit apartment in Oklahoma versus a mobile home park. Had I just bought the 50 unit in Oklahoma, my life would have been a lot easier because I have economies of scale in a market that I know. And that 50 unit was turnkey. Versus I bought this mobile home park in a different market that was value add that required a lot more capital, right? So this shiny object syndrome costed me um, money, it cost me time, it cost me stress. And had I bought that 50 unit apartment complex, I'd probably be in a lot better position than I am today, right? Um, so that was kind of the lesson that I learned. But if we kind of fast forward, I basically had to learn for about a month window to manage my stress. Right. I was very stressed. Like I woke up every day. I was hard to get out of bed. Right. I was beaten up. I was just like, why am I even doing real estate? Right. Like I feel worse off than I did just being a regular pharmacist. They actually made me appreciate my pharmacist job a little more because this is guaranteed income. Right. <laughs> Regardless of how I do, recession, good time, bad time, my W 2 pays me every two weeks. Mobile home park doesn't care. Right. <laughs> good time, bad time. <laughs> ten thousand dollars every month right <laughs> at least so um you know i basically learned like i started a, a miracle morning routine like i meditate in the morning i'll stretch i make sure i was taking supplementation you know vitamin c vitamin d magnesium mbi like i went down this foo foo route right now i'm a pharmacist so i'm the most skeptical person ever and i went down this foo foo <laughs> route i'll journal and it actually helped reduce my stress because i was trying to reframe my mindset to think okay mm -hmm. This sucks now, but in two years, when I look back, will I be mad that I lost $60,000 or went through all the stress? Probably not. This is my battle scars, mm. right? This is the battle scars that I need to accumulate as a real estate investor. It'll make me better moving forward. I just went over a bunch of realizations that I, I told you earlier. I should just went all in on one thing that I was good at, which is apartments in Oklahoma. And it costed me $60,000 to learn that lesson, right? So, you know... Um, you know, for me, that was a huge tangent, but kind of the moral of the story is just find your unfair advantage and stick to it. You can become wealthy just doing one thing. I can become wealthy just buying single family homes in California that I house hack. I can become wealthy buying apartment complexes in Oklahoma City that I own. I could be wealthy owning, uh, if I only did mobile home parks in one area, part of the market. So whatever it is, just pick it and commit to it for the rest of your life. It sounds boring, but boring works. Right. And that cost me $60,000 and a bunch of stress 
I probably aged myself. I, I call it presidential years where, you know, that one year felt like four years <laughs> for me, <laughs> but just the clarity and the mindset that I've gained going through the stress, like it, I'm a completely different investor now and it changed my mindset and my perspective completely. Right. So kind of the moral is yes, you're going to get punched left and right. Like every day I was waking up, something bad was happening to me every day. Oh, Hey, there's a water pipe leak broken at your 20 unit. You got to fix that. And now two other units, my 26 unit. Oh, uh, it was a hail storm. Got to replace your roof. Mobile home park. Oh, um, the, the contractor just quit. You got to find a new one. Oh, the buyer just flaked out on me. Right. Like every day you're just getting punched left and right, left and right. And it, it's hard, right? Cause we're negative creatures and that negativity builds up and I'm a, not a very relatable person. I can't just go to one of my pharmacists and my pharmacy. Say, hey man, like I'm really stressed right now. I feel so terrible. They just <laughs> say, poor you, you own 90 units of real estate. I can't relate. I'm just trying to buy a home for myself. Right. Yeah. So it's very lonely, right? It's a very lonely endeavor, but if you can survive these punches and stand up, that's when you become uh, in a position of strength. So that's how I am today, right? Like literally in the snap of a finger in just October alone, once I sold that mobile home park, I stopped bleeding $10,000 a month. Both my apartment complexes are now fully leased out and renovated. About, nice. I think 44 out of 46 units are now rented out and I'm grossing $26,000 a month just from my apartments. And I'm probably netting about $8,000 net, which is the same as my pharmacist salary. So I went through this crazy journey just to go from like negative $10,000 a month. And now I'm like positive $8,000 a month in the span of a one month. So growth and wealth is exponential. It's not linear. I literally went from like rock bottom all of a sudden, like I'm financially free and I'm still trying to process like what that feeling is to be financially free. So mm. Uh, no, I hit on quite a bit there, <laughs> but that was my huge re realization as I went through this, this journey. Yeah, no, I, I think that there's two big things that I'm taking from this story. One is that despite all the all the things that we hear about real estate, where it's it's uh, portrayed to be this glorious thing where nothing ever bad happens, like bad things do happen, and we need to be prepared. There need to be reserves, and and we just need to expect that so that when it happens, it's a Okay, now I need to I need to roll with this. So I appreciate that kind of transparent angle of like there are bad things that happen. And the other thing I'm taking from this is where you started the story with the apartments that are super boring. You put the same flooring and everything. You put the same paint on everything. You paint the cabinets like you just find a recipe that works and you keep repeating that recipe and repeating that recipe and repeating that recipe. And it sounds like after trying out several different things, you're coming back to like built the playbook. Let's just keep repeating the recipe. It works. Just keep repeating the recipe. It works. So that that discipline to do kind of the kind of boring thing, but it ended up being a huge financial reward and a huge financial success to just do the boring thing. So uh, real estate doesn't have to always be shiny and flashy and fun and new things all the time. Like sometimes the boring is is just the way to go. And I, I think that that uh, level of transparency, I, I really appreciate from your story. I think for those that want to continue to stay tuned in to this story as you as you grow as a real estate investor and you try new things, and particularly with the market as it's coming up, where can people find you if they want to follow your story and and continue to see your your growth and expansion in real estate? Yeah, I can give you my link tree, which has a link to all my socials, but I'm just making multifamily money on Instagram and at Stephen D. Nguyen on YouTube. You know, if you go there, I share a lot about my real estate investing journey. I probably have about over 300 videos on there. Um, just sharing my, my pains. Uh, I call YouTube my therapy, my free therapy, uh, where I'm just talking. Um, but yeah, that, that's where I provide a lot of my most recent updates. Awesome. Well, Steven, thank you so much for joining us on the show today. Um, joining us the last time you were on the show, you're always a wealth of information and we just really appreciate your time and expertise. Yeah, no, happy to share and hopefully prevent some battle scars uh, that people go through or for those going through what I'm going through, which I call the grind, just know there's a light at the end of the tunnel. You just have to make the right moves and, you know, gain that clarity when there's a lot of pain. Thanks for listening to the YFP Real Estate Investing Podcast. If you like what you heard in today's show, please leave us a review and subscribe to the show so you never miss an episode. If you have a question, know someone that would make a good guest or want to connect with us, 
head on over to yfprealestate.com and join the growing YFP Real Estate Investing Facebook group. As we conclude this week's episode of the YFP Real Estate Investing Podcast, an important reminder that the content of this podcast is provided to you for informational purposes only and is not intended to provide and should not be relied on for investment or any other advice. Information in this podcast and corresponding materials should not be construed as a solicitation or offer to buy or sell any investment or related financial products. We urge listeners to consult with their financial advisor with respect to any investment. Furthermore, the information contained in our archive newsletters, blog posts, and podcasts is not updated and therefore may not be accurate at the time you listen to it. Opinions and analyses expressed herein are solely those of your financial pharmacist unless otherwise noted and constitute judgments as of the dates published. Such information may contain forward-looking statements, which are not intended to be guarantees of future events. Actual results could differ materially from those anticipated in the forward-looking statements. For more information, please visit yourfinancialpharmacist.com forward slash disclaimer. Thank you for your support of the YFP Real Estate Investing Podcast. Have a great rest of your week.